welcome those that are here. And also welcome to those that are online. Uh, just like I said, that this is a hybrid kind of seminar in conjunction with the AFMS seminar as well. So uh, today our speaker is Charles Manuva. Uh, he is the Louis, Louis M. Uh, Sander Professor in the Department of Mechanical, Mechanical Engineering and is Associate Director of the Institute for Data Intensive Engineering and Science. He holds joint appointments in the JHU Department of Physics and Astronomy and of Environmental Health and Engineering. So his area of research is focused on understanding and modeling hydrodynamic turbulence and complexity in fluid mechanics in general. The insight that have emerged from Charles' work have led to new numerical models for LES and applications in engineering and environmental flows, including wind farms. He also focuses on developing methods to share the very large data set that arises uh, in CFD. So he received his bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from University that uh, Technica Federico Santa Maria in Valparaiso. Chile in 1985 and advanced degrees from Yale University. He then was a postdoc fellow at the CTR Center for Turbulence at Stanford and has been on the John Hopkins University faculty since 1990. Uh, Charles is deputy director of JFM and has served as the editor in chief of the Journal of Turbulence. Uh, Charles is also a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, a foreign corresponding member of the Chilean Acad that Ac Acad Academia of Science and a fellow of APS and AFMS, uh, AFM, A ASME. He is a recipient of the APS Franco Award, APS Crossing Award, the AIAA Fluid Dynamics Award, and the 2024 Bachelor Prize. So with that, I'll hand the time over to, Char to Charles. Thanks, Charles. Thanks so much, Thanks so much for the hospitality. It's a, a delightful to be visiting uh, Madeleine. Adelaide, um, I'm on sabbatical currently in Melbourne, so I want to thank uh, the colleagues there for the kind invitation and, and having me uh, down under for, again, a, a number of months, which is always very enjoyable. Um, so, and thanks uh, to Ray for organizing this and, uh, and uh, having this as, as part of the seminar series and, uh, and to welcome everyone who's online. Um, so what I thought today I would do is uh, tell you something about some, something rather fundamental about turbulence. Um, so this isn't really going to be a, a kind of an applied uh, talk. It's going to be quite fundamental. Um, I'm not sure we exactly know what it all means. Um, so it's a little bit, you will see, it's a bit of a sort of a, uh, walking around a little bit in the dark and, and, and feeling out certain features of turbulence in, in a particular way. And I'll essentially share with you some observations that uh, we believe are uh, curious and, uh, and hopefully interesting, um, and hopefully you'll, you'll find it interesting. So the, the topic is essentially towards defining uh, entropy uh, for turbulence. Um, this is a long topic. I'll, I'll give a little bit of background on this. But I should start first by thanking, uh, well, this is collaborative work with a postdoc, Kanjun Yao, and colleague uh, Tom Rizaki at Johns Hopkins and P.K. Young, who's a professor at uh, Georgia Tech, who has really been uh, providing the, the, the data uh, through the database. So I'll tell you a little bit about the database and some of the tools we use as well uh, during this talk. Uh, I should thank uh, the National Science Foundation for the financial support um, and, uh, well, and the, the entire database team, uh, again, without whom we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. Uh, if you're interested in further information about this topic, um, we have uh, a paper a few months ago that appeared in JFM. It's a rapid, so it's easy to read. It's fast to read. You can read it probably in 10 minutes. And then there's a, a physical review letters that's uh, that's now in press. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, not yet out, but I think it will be, I think we, we returned the proofs uh, long ago. So I think uh, they will be, uh, soon uh, appearing. So what I'm going to present is, is already uh, published. You can find it there. So entropy generation rate. So turbulent flows, the, the, the usual preliminary. Um, it's uh, three-dimensional. It's very chaotic. It's multi-scale. It's unsteady. It's highly, it's a non-equilibrium system somehow. So um, when I say we're going to define entropy and 
and uh, things from statistical mechanics or thermodynamics, we'll have to be careful uh, because um, turbulence occurs over time scale for, for which there simply is not enough time for thermal equilibrium to establish in any way. Uh, here are a few uh, visualizations uh, on the left, the famous uh, one uh, by Leonardo da Vinci showing some eddies and, and uh, interacting with currents. And on the right, uh, from the multimedia fluid mechanics and animation of uh, eddies shedding from a from, you know, fully separated airflow. Uh, again, time dependent, three dimensional, uh, complicated, uh, expensive to simulate. So um, in, in terms of trying to connect concepts of thermodynamics uh, to turbulence, there's been quite a few efforts in the past. Um, uh, let me mention a few just for historical completeness. Uh, Alexander Chorin uh, generated a framework uh, of, of uh, vortex filaments to model turbulence and essentially applied statistical equilibrium statistical uh, mechanics to uh, this collection of vortex filaments. So you do the kind of the thermodynamics of lines that have vorticity. Um, there's a 1991 paper, so that's a, that's a, that's an example. Uh, there's an interesting paper by uh, Castin in, in Lyon about the turbulent, the temperature. How, how do we define temperature for turbulent flows? And, and somehow we will use a little bit of those ideas. And then more recently, there's been uh, several uh, efforts uh, by the Jimenez Group in Madrid to uh, to consider and, and, and look at entropy and the level of irreversibility that happens in during the cascade of turbulence in, in, in isotropic turbulence mostly. Um, then there is a um, there's you can so you can do you know thermodynamics on the actual flow, which is really what we will do. But uh, but in the past also quite a bit of work has happened on applying thermodynamic concepts to model systems of turbulence. In other words, um, not something directly coming from Navier-Stokes, but um, but some you know if, you, if there's a model, for example, a cascade model where you have steps and there's energy being transferred. Uh, you can think of those as maybe even like for particle physics, particles splitting up and, and, and generating uh, daughter uh, eddies and so on. And, and on those kind of processes, which are entirely model ideas, um, you can build the thermodynamic formalism on those things. So you have to define an ensemble and so on and so forth. And there's some, some, um, some prior papers that, that I mentioned here for quite a while ago. Uh, in 1990, for example, we, we established that um, you could observe even phase transition-like phenomena when you look at, um, at the connections and the spatial correlations between events that happen along a cascade tree. So th those are, but, but those are for model, model systems, um, as well as proper Planck type equations for the cascade processes. Uh, so here are some more recent examples. So again, those are simplified model systems uh, of uh, turbulence. And then on those, on top of those, there's a thermodynamic formalism that somehow has been constructed. So that's, um, that's in terms of the, the history. Now let me, let me go and talk a little bit about the actual physics. Um, so this will be really a talk about the energy cascade. Um, and uh, the, the one thing we, we certainly know uh, for sure, and let me see if this is visible, um, those online, can you see? Can you see my cursor? I don't know if somebody can is able to respond, but I, I'm I'm moving the yes, yes, we can see that. up and down the eddies here. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that's visible. But um, anyway, uh, so what do we know from the Navier-Stokes equations? Um, if you we know the Karman howard kolmogorov equation, which is very well described in Frisch's uh, book, and it often goes under the name of Kolmogorov 41, the 1941. Theory and this deals with the third order structure function, the longitudinal structure function. So you look at two points separated by distance L and you look at the longitudinal components. That means you take the dot product with the separation vector. So these are two points, X plus L and X. You raise it to the power of three and uh, from, the, from the equations, you can find that this should be minus four fifths times the length scale uh, of separation between those two and the average rate of dissipation. So this connects in a way the eddies at scale L in the inertial range of turbulence with the average rate of dissipation. And therefore, if you now solve for this average rate of dissipation and, uh, and then you think you're in the inertial range where viscous effects are uh, really uh, negligible, 
Here is an expression that's based on inertial range quantities, uh, delta u longitudinal cube over L. Uh, you, you, know, you, you gotta multiply by minus four, five fourth, and that will be equal, as it turns out, to the rate of energy dissipation. And of course, a schematic view of this is if you look at the spectrum of turbulence, you have this cascade of energy. If you look at anywhere in between where the eddies are mostly you know, dominated by inertial phenomena, uh, cascading the energy to smaller and smaller scales until viscosity uh, can dissipate this into a sheet. So here's a, a version of the rate at which energy is being cascaded. Uh, which is essentially this thorough structure function uh, model. However, um, there is, of course, a very long and, and rich literature on what's called intermittency. So in the previous slide, I showed epsilon, so that's the average rate of dissipation. But if you look instantaneously in the turbulent flow, it's very spotty. It's very intermittent. Uh, here are, for example, uh, results from, uh, from a DNS, uh, which I'll talk a little more about. Isotropic turbulence is uh, the Reynolds number of about 430, Taylor scale based Reynolds number. That's about 10,000 in terms of the large scale variables, uh, showing essentially these sort of, uh, you know, kind of sci fi high rise type uh, signals with, uh, with a very, very spiky type distribution. Um, so very intermittent. So some places the dissipation is huge and in most of other places it's quite low. So it's very intermittent. It really depends what's going on in space. If you look at the rotation part uh, of this, this velocity gradient tensor, the vorticity, again, it's also very spotty, but you know it's organized along tubes. These are the small scale vortices that are essentially like little hurricanes that occur in the, in the flow. This is, this is a work from my own PhD thesis uh, a long time ago, uh, essentially two signals of dissipation rate measured in two flows. Uh, the top one at a lower Reynolds number, and as you get to a higher and higher Reynolds number, the spottiness gets more and more extreme. In other words, most of the stuff is not, nothing much happening, and then suddenly there's this burst of dissipation, which means it's getting more and more concentrated at smaller scales. And in a way, that is a sort of a, a view of the cascade. The, the longer you wait, the more intermittent it becomes. So. That's, uh, that's all well known. And uh, let me perhaps now switch to another uh, description, which, uh, which we've also worked on quite a bit, which is perhaps more, you know, which is the, the one that, that, that really affects things in practice, which is to run a uh, large eddy simulation. So we run a numerical simulation of filtered Navier-Stokes equations. And now the, the grid scale uh, takes the place of the length scale that we're interested in. And uh, if you look at the momentum equation and you filter it, you def you know, there's essentially an unresolved portion of the momentum transfer, which is called the subgrid scale stresses, tau ij, which is defined so. The tilde here is a spatial filtering at that scale of interest. And so here's another way of defining an energy cascade rate, because when you take that stress and you take its inner product with the filtered strain rate tensor, you get, again, something that on average should be similar to or equal to the energy dissipation rate at the smallest scale. So that's, again, another picture of the cascade that I'll, that I'll be talking about quite a bit. There's a cascade here and, uh, and then the dissipation here. So there's an average flux of all smaller scales uh, that can be computed in a turbulent flow by taking this inner product of this stress tensor times the strain rate at the large scale. So again, that's a measure of the cascade. All right, notice that this is being averaged on average, so this is the equation that I have here is an actually a dynamic equation for the small scale kinetic energy. Uh, we'll refer to this equation a little bit like the first law. Okay, that's going to be a connection with thermodynamics to some degree. It's a conservation of energy in some sense, or a rate of change of energy. That's the kinetic energy in the scale smaller than this, and there's a sink term uh, that uh, that uh, that is going to be. The, uh, the dissipation rate, and uh, then there's a sense, some sense of source for those for those energy, which is the subgrid, which is the energy that's being taken out of the large scales. However, uh, and this this has been known. Uh, this is something called backscatter in the large eddy simulation literature. It's something that's been known for for a number of years. Uh, essentially, when you go and you measure this quantity locally without averaging, so I'm going to call this one pi l. Uh, so again, on, on averaging, this becomes equal to the dissipation rate, but locally you can, you can it's still a, 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 a sink or source term uh, in, this, uh, in this equation. You can go and measure this uh, uh, essentially 
uh, without averaging. Uh, yeah, so something. Yeah, you you can you can measure this without averaging, and then you can measure it in an actual flow. And on the right is results from direct numerical simulation. On the on the left is uh, the original measurements from the early nineties by Pumel in channel flow. Essentially showing that when you go and you measure this instantaneously, um, it on average it's positive and it's equal to the dissipation rate in the cascade, but instantaneously locally it can be negative uh, quite a number of times. And this negative value, in a way, is then interpreted as a, a local inverse cascade because in the energy equation it shows up with the opposite sign, and therefore this is somehow locally must mean something about. Uh, energy coming from small scales going to larger scales. In two-dimensional turbulence, we're used to this concept. You know, there's a the generic process there is two small vortices coming together and uh, merging and essentially transferring its energy to larger and larger scales, uh, growth of hurricanes and so on. So kind of examples of this inverse cascade. Locally, when you measure it, even in three-dimensional uh, isotropic turbulence, where on average the energy is forward, the cascade, uh, locally, however, you can have many instances where, where it's the other way when you actually measure it. Okay, So this, this has been studied in the LES literature for a long time. Um, maybe I'll, this is a good place to, to mention that if you, if you use an eddy viscosity model for turbulence, um, in other words, you replace the stress tensor with an eddy viscosity times the strain rate, this becomes one-sided. It's only forward cascade, of course. Um, uh, but when you actually measure the actual physical object, there's quite a bit of time when it's going the other way. So this was known, this has been known for a long time in the large data simulation literature. And what I'll tell you a little bit about is some features of this that, uh, that we've started to understand now using concepts from non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Because, okay, maybe the first statement here to make is that if the stress tensor was the viscous stress, you put a positive viscosity there, and this dissipation becomes positive everywhere. You cannot have negative dissipation, uh, as we know. The second law of thermodynamics forces the viscosity to be positive, and therefore this pi uh, becomes positive because the, the tau itself become, is minus the viscosity times the strain rate, so you get a positive quantity everywhere, as we know. Right? The dissipation is positive everywhere, the molecular dissipation, but this kind of cascade subgrid dissipation um, has two signs, as you can see here. Uh, on the left here is, uh, is backscatter or inverse cascade. And so already by definition, if I have an eddy viscosity, I cannot really represent that. So this was known and we you know, we've been looking at this for quite a, a while. And um, yeah, and uh, that's what I want to tell you about. Um, these are measurements um, in various uh, as aspects that uh, we've been doing for quite a while. Um, for example, on the left are measurements in the early 2000s, where with Joe Katz, we used holographic PIV in an index matched uh, facility where, um, where we had three dimensional vector fields that we could measure snapshots of. So we could directly go in and do what's called a priori tests. So you actually measure the stress by spatial filtering. You take its uh, product with the strain rate, and what you can get is, so uh, you can, for example, get a joint PDF of that local dissipation rate with the strain rate magnitude. And you can see that uh, quite a bit of the time it's negative here. This, these are negative, uh, again, these are corresponding to inverse cascade. Locally, maybe little eddies are joining together, who knows. Uh, the conditional average, overall, it's positive. Uh, but of course, then it's even more positive in certain regions. Uh, on the left is, is one that I, I always find interesting to to mention, these are measurements in the uh, flat, uh, in the salt flats in the U in Utah in the U.S. Uh, that we did again. This is quite a while ago using anemometer, sonic anemometers. So as you can see on the right, there are sonic anemometers arranged in a square, and the wind is blowing perpendicular to these sonic anemometers, and so we can use Taylor's hypothesis to interpret that as a cut through the flow. And if you average all those measurements from the sonics and in time a little bit, you can mimic a spatial filter uh, using this kind of device. And so with this, we could actually also again measure the, this, this energy cascade rate, pi of L, uh, by taking this inner product of tau s. And on the bottom, you can see the, the PDF, essentially the probability density function. And again, 
its average is positive. Uh, I forget what the average number was, but it was maybe here somewhere you get an average positive, maybe, I don't know, one meter square per second cube. Those are the units. But as you can see, there's a strong you know, negative part where a lot of times you just get a negative number. And this, this has been known for a long time. It generates a sort of a conceptual problem how to model this using an eddy viscosity model. There's plenty of other models that have some of these features. But I think up to now, there was, there was a lack of trying to describe this using quantitative means and, and conceptually connect them to things that one might be uh, used to in, in, in physics. So, so let me go in, in that direction. Now, before I do that, uh, what I was describing here was a definition of this energy cascade rate using spatial filtering. Okay, so this is what you, you know, when you do large data simulations, you put a spatial filter at a certain scale, typically in the inertial range, so you want to save uh, a resolution. And then we defined a stress tensor, we took the inner product with the strain rate, and we got a definition of this cascade rate, as I described. There's another one, um, which will turn out to be fundamentally perhaps more interesting, perhaps more fundamental now, I'm not kind of a... Uh, uh, but I, I should say, we still don't quite understand the, the, the connections uh, between them and what it all means. But let, so here we go. So the, um, the other definition of this cascade rate is based on a Reginald Hill uh, uh, this, uh, derivation of, of a more generalized structure function approach. So again, um, in, this, in this formalism, it's actually looking at velocity differences uh, over a distance certain distance, so, uh, but it's, uh, he's formulated in a symmetric way. So you put your position in the middle, and then there's a separation vector R between the two points that you're interested in describing the turbulence. And so one, one end is this middle point minus one half R, the other one is plus one half R, and you define the velocity increment, um, again, at position X, but at uh, displacement R, sorry, the pointer here is kind of appears and disappears. Uh, you define it uh, as essentially the, the, the difference between velocities at one point and the other point. So you plus is here, you minus is here. And again, so it's a velocity increment, but it's local and it has center point X. And then what Hill did, he derived a, a transport equation for the energy con content of this delta U difference. So you do the usual thing, you take Navier Stokes, you write it at two points, you multiply, you do things. And here's a local equation, so for this uh, velocity squared. So now it's a magnitude. Up here it's a vector. Here it's a magnitude, and so you can see this this being this sort of local energy being advected at u, u star. By the way, is the velocity. Uh, it's one half of the two velocities, so it's like um, it's like an interpolated midpoint velocity. And then the nonlinear term gives rise to to this. So this is a, a divergence in this R space. Again, there's change of variables and so on. There's a pressure. Uh, again, the midpoint, or the, I guess the average pressure, P star, there's a viscous term, two viscous terms, and then there's the dissipation rate, the local dissipation rate, again, the one half of the dissipation at the two points. So again, the star here means something uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, you know, the average of the two points. And then there's many variants of this equation have been studied. I put uh, a few uh, uh, representative uh, uh, papers here with uh, with their years, so you can see again the nice thing about this, as opposed to the original uh, Kolmogorov equation, that, uh, that the four fifth equation is that this one is more general because it doesn't necessarily start out by saying let's assume isotropy, let's assume homogeneity. It's, it's quite it's uh, reasonably general still. And uh, and then the the important thing is to notice that this term here, that this is the cubic term, so this is the this comes from the advective term. Um, is essentially written as a divergence in the vector r, which is the displacement vector between the two. So here we have a divergence, okay? And, um, and essentially what Hill recognized in 2002 is that because it's a divergence, now, you know, this, this equation invites you to take a local spherical average. So now I center a sphere at x, and I do a, you know, integrating concentric spheres up to some length scale r, and that is uh, something that uh, this equation kind of invites you to do. And, uh, and, and then you notice that this is a divergence in, in scale R. So I know, this, sorry, this is a little bit heavy in, in equations, but what you get is something like this that has essentially a, uh, has, so, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to the equation in, in yellow at the bottom and then explain each of the terms. 
So one is the advective derivative of the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy, let me see, is defined somewhere, is defined right here. So this is, this is now the volume integrated uh, delta u squared. So it's all the energy, it's all the kinetic energy and velocity differences at scales smaller than uh, some L that I specify. So L will be my outer sphere. And this is the kinetic energy in all smaller scales, but it's local and it's instantaneous. Um, it's a little bit, again, there are LES versions of this as well. Um, and then you, you know, you, when you do, and then you do this volume integration of the equation. So you get a term here on the left, which is essentially by definition, I interpret it as this advective derivative of kinetic energy. Uh, and, a, uh, and then there's a, a spatial gradient or divergence of, of a sort of heat flux uh, Q, which uh, I will not really talk much about. Uh, what is important is this cubic term. So this is the dui d squared times the normal velocity. That's the one that uh, where we use Gauss theorem to take this volume integral into a surface integral. So now this, this term here essentially becomes um, a flux in our space of energy, either into the sphere or out of the sphere. Uh, again, using Gauss theorem. The other terms are also interesting. There's a pressure term here, which uh, which I will just leave like this again. There's a, there's a gradient. So again, divergence theorem was used. Again, it's a, it becomes a surface integral over the, the sphere. There's viscous terms that I'm not going to say much about. These will be in the inertial range when the scale is in the inertial range. We assume that to be negligibly small. And then there's the locally volume integrated dissipation rate. Um, again, you take the epsilon at every point and you just integrate it over sphere. Uh, which again, those of you who are familiar with the Kolmogorov of uh, 62, the Kolmogorov refined similarity hypothesis, this is an important um, quantity. It's the volume averaged uh, rate of dissipation. So we have several quantities here now. We have the kinetic energy of all scales, smaller, in, but at position X at time T, its transport equation looks like this. There's a there's some sort of an advective derivative uh, using some coarse grain velocity of this kinetic energy. There's some spatial fluxes. And then there's this phi of L, which is essentially the surface integral. And notice this is like a third order structure function. This is sort of delta U squared times delta U dotted with a normal. So it's like a, a U cube, delta U cube. And, uh, and then there's a pressure term and then there's an epsilon. But this is a local equation. I haven't done any ensemble or, or uh, statistical averaging, okay? If I do ensemble statistical averaging and I use isotropic turbulence, the pressure term goes away because of isotropy, the unsteady and spatial gradients go away because of homogeneity. And what you end up with is an equality of the average of this phi, which is this cascade rate, and the average, this local box average, but the average of it, epsilon. So again, it represents the cascade, but it has local elements in it uh, as far as the equation is concerned. So again, this phi is going to occupy us for pretty much the rest of the talk. So it's again, it's a surface integral of velocity increments over sphere of size L, and, uh, and there's a three quarter with a minus sign and so on. It just comes directly from the equation. And there's a pressure term, and then there's this volume effort integrated uh, rate of dissipation. Uh, by the way, if there are questions um, and you'd like to interrupt, um, I don't know how that would work or will work with the uh, online people, but um, just uh, scream into microphone if, uh, if there's an urgent question. Uh, let's see. So uh, here is the um, here is the equation then um, written a little more clearly, and there's one that is this divergence uh, like that. Okay. So I think I've already said all of this, so there's no need to run you through this. But again, here's the definition of each of these terms. Um, this is the equation we're going to look at, and there's essentially a a a, a flux term to smaller scales, there's a pressure work term, and there's this dissipation term, okay? So, um, yeah, I guess this is a summary of it. So here's our measure of kinetic energy. Here's the rate of change. Here's the transport equation. That's gonna be our first law of thermodynamics, right? Conservation of kinetic energy. And here's the definition of all the terms. And again, this phi term is really like a structure function, but now it contains all elements. And if you if you do an average and you assume it's statistically homogeneous and stationary and so on, then this becomes what's known as the four-thirds law. So it's not the four-fifths law, but it's the four-thirds law simply because this is not just one velocity component. This has 
contraction of all three components and then so on. But it's, it's uh, again, something you can show using isotropy, it's a fourth third of um, And this, there's quite a bit of literature on this. All right, but we'll, we'll be concerned with this local equation. So we have two formalisms. We have the structure function approach, uh, which I just, just described. There's a sort of an equivalent first law of cons conservation of kinetic energy. There's a definition of kinetic energy. And then I had talked about before, there's a lar large eddy simulation filtering approach where, um, where instead of taking two points at a variable R and writing things where I have a divergence in R, remember that the, the structure function approach had that element. It has a divergence in R space, which turns out to be crucial, I believe. In the filtering approach, you just say, I'm gonna filter coarse grain at a certain scale in the inertial range, and then, and then you have it. And then in the energy equation, there's either sink or source terms, and that's what we interpret as the cascade rate, either sink or source term, but it doesn't really come from a divergence in scale space. Whereas in the structure function, it actually comes from a divergence in scale space. In other words, you look at how does the energy flux change as I change the scale, uh, which uh, is subtly different, uh, I believe. On average, if you take an overall average, all of those are equivalent. In other words, the average subgrid scale energy dissipation, uh, the average uh, this uh, structure function third order uh, 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 moment, uh, um, and then the average of the locally average dissipation and the overall average dissipation. So if the turbulence is high Reynolds number, statistically steady state, um, all of these are equal. Okay. So we'll, we'll put that in a little box as, um, as something uh, for us to, to remember. Again, we have two first laws, so to speak. There's the rate of change of the structure function kinetic energy, and then there's this uh, subgrid scale kinetic energy that's, that involves spatial filtering. And the structure of these equations look kind of similar. All right. If you go into uh, data, and, um, and uh, yeah, so here we use uh, data from a uh, direct numerical simulation of isotropic turbulence that was provided uh, by Professor P.K. Young at Georgia Tech. And this uh, data is uh, one, of them, one of the data sets that's available through the Hopkins uh, database system. Um, the Taylor scale Reynolds number is relatively high, about 12, 1200. Again, those uh, experts at turbulence will know. This is, it required uh, DNS using about 8,000 cube grid points, which, which is quite, I mean, this, this is stuff that took uh, many weeks on a, on a large supercomputer with, uh, with a lot of resources. Uh, and then we have essentially of this one, we have six snapshots stored in the database. It's relatively easy to, to, uh, to, uh, to access and do analysis. So let me just show you some qualitative features of these two quantities, the two quantities, the structure function version and the subgrid scale kinetic energy. On the left is a joint PDF of those two. So you can see they're quite correlated. In other words, places where one of them is very large and then someone is also the other one is large. They're slightly different. The definitions are a little different. One has sort of sharp velocity differences of two points and then you average that over sphere. The other one has a spatial filtering over ball. So, so the, the calculation is done differently. Uh, and then so is the, uh, uh, the energy fluxes. So this one is very highly correlated. I think it's probably like 80% uh, correlation coefficient. This one is more like, uh, I forget now what it was, maybe 60%, but um, again, joint PDF of these two flux terms. So this is the subgrid scale flux, again, the contraction of tau ij, sij, and here's this structure function-based energy flux coming from this divergence of the R divergence of the structure function equation. There, there's some correlation between them. Uh, maybe I think this, this was maybe 50, 50, 60% correlation. Uh, but the key element is in both of these, uh, you can see significant amounts of negative, again, inverse cascade backscatter. So again, physically interpretation would be that of uh, reverse energy flow from small to larger scales. So let me start with some questions. So the, the backscatter and filtering approach, um, as it turns out, there's some, in the, in the literature, there's a, a little bit of uh, controversy because, because of this sort of mathematical fact. When you, when you look at the energy equation, the, the local force is just the divergence of the stress tensor. And then you say, I want the energy. So I multiply, dot multiply with velocity. So that's the term that we get from the equation. And then this gets rewritten as a divergence of this third order quantity, 
minus the quantity I was talk, 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 talking about. And if you do an averaging, then typically if it's homogeneous, this thing will go away and you're just left with this. So this is the net sink or source. But people have argued uh, to some degree that when you look locally, maybe this, di you know, this divergence, that this, this term here, that really means fluxes in physical space might, might be important. And, and it's not quite clear that this locally without uh, averaging, that is this really the energy flux? So uh, there were a lot of question marks and, 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 and there's been quite a bit of discussion about this. Um, conversely, in the structure function approach, uh, it seems more fundamental because now you have velocity differences and you have this R vector and the and the, the transfer really comes from a Gauss theorem application where you have a divergence in R space. So there truly is a, 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 a scale space where we're changing the scale and we're identifying really a flux rather than just a sink or source term. So it's a flux in scale space. So in that sense, maybe the structure function approach is slightly physically more uh, intuitive and more direct. Um, now, the other statement, again, that I alluded to is, you know, those places in the flow where there's negative dissipation in a way that that's a kind of a violation of thermodynamics, but it's a strange thermodynamics, right? It's a thermodynamics somehow that is defined based on, on the eddies of turbulence, not on molecules. And that's really what I'll talk about. I'll, I'll you know, we'll talk about an analogy between eddies and molecules. And then we're going to see to what degree um, can, um, can, can there be local instantaneous violations of the uh, second uh, law of thermodynamics. Because when we're talking about molecular systems, of course, we know that's not possible. Yeah. We'll see that in this case, it is actually possible. Um, now, um, yeah, so the, the place to start is, um, is to essentially talk about non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So thermodynamics, when, when, uh, when the system is not really in, in thermal equilibrium, and there's such a thing, it's a, it's a, it's a whole branch of, uh, of statistical physics, and there's something that's always caught my attention because there were papers in the physics literature, you know, probability of violation of second law. These were reputable journals, so this was not, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, anything bad. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, what kind of papers one would reject out of hand. No, no, these were serious, serious people talking about violation of second law. And it turns out essentially that um, this is good for small systems where you only have a few particles interacting, or you look at things in very short time scales, time scale that are perhaps not long compared to collisions between molecules and so on. So there's something called, so that's non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So there's something that had caught my attention for a long time, which is called the fluctuation relation. So what I thought I'd do is, uh, is give you a kind of a, a, a very schematic explanation of, the, of what's called the fluctuation relation from non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And it's, uh, it's really a cartoon version. Uh, uh, I'm, Sure, maybe some some experts might might not might not like it the way I'm presenting it, but um, okay. Um, so I call it the poor man's explanation of the fluctuation relation, but it's a it's a very fundamental, very interesting uh, idea. So the, here the idea is: imagine you look at turbulence in phase space. So this is now not physical space with x, y, z. This is phase space where you have all coordinate, you know, velocities and momenta. Uh, it's very high dimensional, um, and so on. And typically for a, for a dissipative system, on average, if you start with a set of initial conditions, so we have an initial volume of initial conditions, A, and you let it evolve in time, typically the volume will shrink um, because the, the volume in some sense is a, is, a, is a measure of energy. You can, you can imagine if it's velocity and, and, and position, you know, there's potential energy will just depend on position and there's kinetic energy will depend on velocity, you square those, you add them, you get the total energy, it shrinks, uh, you have dissipation. So the volume in phase space uh, shrinks. And as we know from dynamical systems, uh, typically volumes in phase space will shrink exponentially. Right? So we'll have this shrinkage rate of volume in phase space, and it'll go like something like this, e to the minus something t. And then essentially the, the, the rate of, of shrinkage is simultaneously uh, the rate of entropy generation. In other words, you know, the, 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 the quicker it shrinks, the more quickly entropy gets generated in, in, in sort of regular uh, sort of understanding of, of statistical systems. Now, you know, the, 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 the microscopic dynamics are time reversible. 
you know, like collisions of, of molecule atoms in an ideal gas and so on, all of this is reversible. So the reverse evolution is also possible. Uh, and here I'm gonna say essentially already ahead of time that we're, we're gonna consider this not the molecules of the air of the water, but some, some statistical description of eddies at certain scale, okay? And, um, and we're gonna assume that we're in the inertial range so that the viscosity really is not yet really operative. And so the, the reverse is actually also possible. So the reverse inverse dynamics are uh, also a possible evolution. Uh, so, so you can go from A to B, or, but also from B to A. And then the trick is simply that in addition, the probability of encountering a state is somewhat proportional to the volume that it occupies in phase space. In other words, the way I've drawn this phase space here, if I take a measurement, there'll be more points in A than in B because the, the phase space is shrinking as time goes in one direction. But the reverse is still possible because it's a reverse in the inertial range, right? If I don't have the effects of viscosity, that is still a possible dynamic. So that is also possible, but the chances of me landing in B is much smaller. So the poor man's explanation of the fluctuation relation is simply that my chance of landing in A is a certain amount, my chance of landing in B is significantly smaller, and the ratio between them is related with that rate of entropy generation itself. So if I, if, I, if I do that, if I now take the ratio of probabilities, which somehow is going to be the ratio of the volumes in phase space, uh, I, I'm going to have this ratio of these volumes in phase space, and the ratio of volumes is simply the exponential. Okay? So, <laughs> so if, I, if, I, if I take now the logarithm of this ratio of probabilities of possible of positive entropy generation and negative entropy generation with the same value, that should go, well, so if I take the log, that should go linear with this entropy generation. But that's a prediction from kind of a mixture of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, chaos theory, and so on and so forth, because again, chaotic systems have, uh, have exponential growth of, uh, of separation and shrinkage of, uh, of volume. So, um, Okay, so, so that's, that's the first thing we can test. We can actually now take, right? I can say, all right, let me take a measure of entropy generation, right? And, uh, and this flux of kinetic energy that I had described before, um, in the literature, very, very often, you, you will find this quite a few times where people call that the, it's related to the entropy generation. In other words, that flux pi, you know, the, the more you flux to small scales, the, bigger the entropy and growing more and more entropy. So that's somehow proportional to the entropy generation rate. And when it's negative, well, then you got sort of negative uh, entropy generation, which again, for the for, for molecular systems is essentially impossible. And the second law in a way is a statement of this with the exponential with a time being much, much bigger than the characteristic molecular times, collision times between particles. In other words, the probability of positive entropy generation, which is the one we know from second law, divided by the probability of something that see, apparently violates second law is exponential with that entropy generation rate in time. So if T is much bigger than, than one over psi, then, then the probability of negative is essentially exponentially small. That's another way of looking at the second law, if you will. It's a quantitative way. Think of it this way. If I have a box and I have molecules floating, run, running around, colliding, and so on, ideal gas if you want, what is the probability of suddenly all the molecules going to one side? It's like zero, right? That, that would violate second law. Okay, if I have 10 to the 20 and Bogadro number particles, that is zero, right? But what if I have six? If I have six particles, you know, running around, colliding, and so on, every so often, I bet all six will be on one, one side. So that's the idea, that if you have very few degrees of freedom, if your microscopic degrees of freedom are not huge in numbers, not like thermodynamic Avogadro number type uh, numbers, those probabilities become finite. And what the fluctuation relation does, it quantifies the probability of those things happening. The same way as you can probably, you know, you could probably, if you only had six particles, you could kind of uh, guess how, with what probability will we, will we have all six on one side in some binomial theorem something, you can calculate those things. So that's, that's, uh, that's a prediction from the fluctuation relation. And again, in the turbulence analogy, 
there is, you know, the, we envision a sort of thermodynamic formalism where the where we don't have molecules as as the microscopic degrees of freedom, but essentially eddies at scales smaller than whatever scale I'm talking about. L. Okay, but there's not that many of them, right? If I look at the small scale eddies that really affect scales larger, it's just maybe it's again it's a small, relatively small number, certainly not ten to the twenty. And so that's why we kind of thought we were we would be interested in looking at this. So um, so here's a quantitative prediction. It's called the fluctuation relation. It says that the probability of forward to negative is exponential with this uh, generation entropy generation rate times time. And so here here is a, a first test, which which I have a feeling a lot of people already had tried. So here is from, uh, so this is from this data set, uh, the 8,000 uh, DNS. We calculated the PDF of either, so A here is either the subgrid dissipation rate or the structure function uh, energy flux term. And we do this in the inertia range at 45 Kolmogorov scales. Um, again, we have quite a range of scales to, 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 to think about. I'll, I'll show some more about the data analysis in a, in a second. But this was, this is sort of the first, uh, uh, test and, and and in a way we we had tried this some time ago because I was aware of this uh, fluctuation relation and if the fluctuation relation holds and the ge entropy generation rate is interpreted as this energy cascade rate and right and so when it's negative it's inverse so that's sort of a violation uh, we can calculate the PDF of it and take this ratio for when it's positive or negative. So those are less, those PDFs that I show. You take the log and if the fluctuation relation were to work, I should get a straight line. It should be a straight line with the, with the number. And again, if this energy dissipation rate, you can normalize it with the overall average dissipation rate, but the subgrid or the structure function energy flux. This is, you know, this is not, a, these are not straight lines. I, I think we all agree. And I, I, I suspect that a lot of people might have tried this before in previous years, and you end up with a result like this, and you say, well, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, so no thermodynamics. Here. So let's leave this in a little box uh, like this. And essentially, um, maybe we'll say this may not be the right definition of the entropy generation rate of turbulence. So that's where we started. And we thought, okay, let's go back and let's look at definitions of entropy. So the, the Gibbs equation is uh, very familiar to us from thermodynamics. So changes in entropy multiplied by absolute temperature related with internal energy changes and then worked out PDV. If you, if you rewrite this, um, these increments following a material element, as we do in fluid mechanics, then you just divide this equation by dt, right? Uh, and interpret all these time derivatives as the Lagrangian material derivatives. That's the usual trick we do when we teach these things. So, um, uh, all right, there's, uh, okay, two questions uh, that we'll discuss at the end. Thank you, yeah, that's that's great. Uh, so um, following a fluid element, so we divide by delta T, we, we, we do this. And now we, we, uh, we make the following analogy, right? We, we say, well, the internal energy of our system is going to be this K. This is our, uh, you know, the kinetic energy that I told you about. This is the kinetic energy of all eddies smaller than L. And, uh, and then uh, that's the, its equation is given by this. So this becomes our first law of thermodynamics. Uh, and then there's this PDV, there's this pressure work term, which we interpret as this PL, which was this spherically integrated pressure times the normal velocity. So this truly is the work done by pressure uh, against velocity increments over the sphere. This comes from the equations. There's really very little uh, uh, interpretation. And, uh, and so, so essentially, Comparing this equation with uh, with what we know, it invites us to uh, define the entropy of turbulence at scale L as as essentially its rate of change as, as one over temperature times. And now I just replace uh, this rate of change of energy. I just replace it with the right hand side here. So I have phi. I have plus P L minus epsilon minus the spatial gradient of kinetic of kinetic energy. And uh, then I, the pressure work, I, re I replaced with what we had before, which is, uh, you know, this term I replaced with the pressure work, so that eliminates it. And so I have a definition of the rate of change of 
turbulent entropy as one of the temperature, and then there's our cascade rate, there's minus the molecular dissipation integrated at that scale, and then spatial diffusion. So this is a rate of change of, I can define the entropy of turbulence in specifically this way. Right, so that's the equation at the top. Now this system, right, this, these eddy systems, they are, like we normally do in, in thermodynamics, they're, they're exchanging heat with a reservoir, also at temperature T, uh, and the rate of exchange with this heat reservoir is the viscous dissipation. Right? So the, the reservoir, its entropy is rising equal at the rate equal to epsilon over whatever the, the temperature is. So that's the rate of change of the reservoir. And then you say, okay, I have my eddies, I have a thermal reservoir, what's the total entropy? And that's the one that in classical thermodynamics should obey the second law and so on and so forth. So it's a total entropy, you add them together and you'll see elegantly this epsilon term here will cancel, right? will cancel. And uh, this is the same we do when we de derive the sort of the transport version of the entropy equation. So the rate of change of total entropy is, uh, and then some of the stuff cancels, you can rewrite it essentially uh, like so. So rate of change of total entropy generation is our flux term divided by temperature. And then there are some spatial, uh, uh, spatial gradients of a temperature, whatever that temperature is, okay? And, uh, and then this, this is a spatial divergence. So this is spatial transport of entropy. So this, because it's written as a divergence, doesn't create or destroy, it just brings from different places. So we're not gonna be interested in that particular term. We're gonna be interested in the sources of entropy, which is, again, if you move with this material of turbulence, uh, what is the rate at which the total entropy of the system is increasing or decreasing, all right? And so we have one term that's associated with the temperature gradients. I'm putting temperature here in quotation marks. And another term that is our old, very old, very same energy flux term at scale. Um, we're going to focus on this one. Um, and the sort of this gradient of temperature term, we're starting to look at it right now, but we're going to focus on, on this one. So again, this, this is an analogy to the second law for fluids where you, you have both one that's due to viscosity, viscous friction generating entropy, and one uh, heat conductivity generating entropy. In that case, you would put here, you would put the heat flux uh, with the conductivity, you get a you know, positive conductivity, it would give you rising temperature. And in this one, you would put a viscous stress tensor with a positive viscosity time, the strain rate would give you positive. So you, you you know that you're generating positive entropy, but here we're doing things at scale L for turbulence. All right. So, uh, so here is uh, essentially the uh, the, uh, the situation. So we have a we now have a definition of the total entropy generation rate of turbulence at scale L. It's the ratio of this flux term that we had identified. Think of it as delta Q. Right. In thermodynamics, you know, ds equals delta Q over t. That's kind of the analogy here. So think of that phi is like a delta Q, it's like a heat addition. Um, and uh, on, again, on average, it's irreversible. On average, it has to be positive, but instantaneously, locally, as we know now, it can, it can switch sign. But it, you gotta divide by temperature. And that was the key, perhaps, to, to make some sense out of this. So uh, the entropy generation rate is not the cascade rate phi or pi that we were talking about before. It's not, you gotta divide by temperature. And that's the key step. Just like here, you got to divide by temperature. So we just tried the most obvious one, which is to take as a measure of the temperature, again, the kinetic energy, something proportional to the kinetic energy of the small scale turbulence. So again, KL, right? Which for ideal gases, for example, that's also what you do. Uh, there you have the internal energy and the temperature that are proportional with this CV and proportionality here. It's just a so we take the small scale kinetic energy as a measure of temperature, and we define this as now the total entropy production rate for turbulence at scale L and position X. So this is still all quite local, but integrated over sphere of size L. So it's really, what is it? It's the ratio of this third order moment divided by, uh, again, a surface integrated divided by a volume integral of the kinetic energy. So that's the definition. That's the division by temperature. So um, that's uh, our definition of entropy generation rate, but it's kind of respectful of the structure of the equations. So uh, to recap, we, we regard the evolution of the small scale eddies below L 
but significantly larger than the Kolmogorov scale. We, we kind of assume those are uh, governed by the inviscid part of the Navier-Stokes equations, only when you get to really the small scales that viscous effects uh, come in. So the dynamics of those eddies are actually almost reversible, um, just like molecular degrees of freedom are completely reversible. It's only once you coarse grain in thermodynamics that you get the thermodynamics description. Um, so those adding degrees of freedom in the inertial range would be an analog of the reversible dynamics of the microscopic level of the molecules. Um, so in the molecular systems, they give rise to, because there's so many of them, and you average over your time description is much, much longer than collisions. You have billions of collisions by the time you've measured a macroscopic time, both that and the fact that you have so many it's always positive. Those exponential really just come in as you know, almost infinity. And, and therefore we only get positive dissipation, but here the numbers are small and times are small. Um, we have a prediction of the ratio of these uh, probabilities and therefore uh, we, the reversible inviscid eddy motions at scale smaller than L, they give rise to, to this uh, energy cascade the same way as the reversible microscopic dynamics uh, ultimately give rise to positive dissipation. But because of this lack of scale separation between small scale and size L, it, essentially there's few, few eddies. So you have with some probability bizarre effects like reverse energy cascade and violations of the sort of traditional second law. So this, this shrinkage rate can be both positive or negative. And, uh, and there, but we've noticed that we need to, to get really to a good definition of entropy generation rate, we must divide by temperature. We can't just take this energy flux. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, data that, um, that we uh, use. So again, I, I told you already, this is the 8,000 uh, cube. Uh, it's on the Hopkins database system. So everybody can access it uh, using various tools that by the way, we're right now updating, but uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, uh, this 8,000 cube is pretty big. So every, we have six snapshots, I have five at one, with one resolution, another one at another resolution um, and lower Reynolds number, but we're gonna use the higher Reynolds number case. Um, so one snapshot is seven terabytes. So that's a lot of data, um, but I think we've, um, we've developed tools for people to access them in, in sort of user-friendly ways where you don't have to download an entire snapshot. Know, downloading seven terabytes would, uh, would be a little lengthy. Um, so we have developed uh, tools to uh, access small parts of it in, uh, in fairly user-friendly ways. So uh, again, as a, as a summary, we, we, the, the PK at his group did these simulations on kind of many weeks of high-performance computing uh, uh, cost, uh, and then output these uh, snapshots. Um, originally, uh, these snapshots are in Fourier space. That was no good. We don't, we don't want people to have to transform from Fourier space to physical space. So PK um, transformed them to physical space and then sent us uh, little by little these big snapshots. Those were in, ingested in, in physical space to the database system. And again, they are accessible using web services. And, uh, and we're right now, again, developing the new Python library uh, to, to change things a little bit. So there's a new version that's about to come up. And what we do with that is uh, we essentially draw uh, little spheres of size in the inertial range um, in the uh, in the uh, yeah in this in this flow we distribute them uh, randomly and um, yeah I'm getting a little confused and with this half hour uh, how much time do I have left? <laughs> Almost finished. Uh, probably, probably, usually we run for one hour, but yeah. I mean, if people are saying online, that's okay with us. Okay, okay, it's already okay. So, um, so this is the data set. Um, again, we wanted to test the fluctuation relation. So essentially, I'm, I'm almost out of time already. Um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, we just started a bit late. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Five Good. Minutes. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's the it's that half hour because I'm I'm looking at my computer, which is at a different time zone. Sorry about that. Anyway, so remember logarithm of positive to negative uh, uh, fluxes. Uh, we observe essentially uh, from uh, many, many of these spheres, we have good statistics. We do now observe a pretty much straight line. 
So, uh, so the this uh, so isotropic turbulence with the uh, dissipation defined in this right way, uh, in fact, does uh, obey the fluctuation relation. Interestingly enough, when you uh, do it for the LES version, these curves are curved. So this doesn't this doesn't seem to be the right definition somehow of entropy generation. So we don't quite know what that means in terms of uh, LES. But again, when you use spatial filtering, which is not this divergence, we get a different answer. So this does not uh, uh, obey things. Whereas this is the result I had already shown for well, the fluxes themselves. Uh, again, no no such thing. You've got to divide by temperature. So that's, that's crucial. Uh, some further observations uh, where we relate this to Kolmogorov's uh, refined similarity hypothesis. So we do a conditional uh, analysis of this where we now condition on, on local values of epsilon sub L. Um, and uh, on the left are PDFs of, uh, of this uh, flux, but now conditioned on epsilon L. Again, those of you who know about Kolmogorov similarity hypothesis, the idea is to identify subregions of the flow where epsilon has a certain value. When we use that to define the time scale, all these PDFs co co coincide and give us a pretty good approximation, again, to the sort of Kolmogorov refined similarity hypothesis version of the, um, of the fluctuation relation. Uh, there's something called the integral fluctuation relation, which, uh, which I probably don't have enough time, but it, 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 for these systems, it says actually that the average of the exponential of minus the change of entropy should be one. This is a very strong prediction. And for us, the change of entropy is actually the rate that I just described times this term of the time scale. Um, so, um, and uh, we tried this at different scales and we get pretty much uh, one, uh, very, very close to one. So it's remarkable that the integral relation is also obeyed. Uh, it might be related to the fact that the PDFs are exponential. So when you take the ratio of two, you get exponential anyway. So we believe it's probably a hint. Uh, what might, uh, how we might understand these uh, phenomena a little better. Um, here's some quantitative implications of having two exponential sides. The positive ha has one slope, the negative is much steeper on the negative side, and uh, the ratio of these slopes is about two, which has uh, a number of additional implications, in addition to showing that actually the average of this exponential effect is one when we have two exponential PDFs. So, to a good approximation, because the PDF of this entropy generation rate appears to be exponential, not stretched exponential, but just exponential. Once you divide by temperature, you get exponentials. Um, so we have both the regular fluctuation relation and the integral fluctuation relation. So as a as summary and conclusion, maybe let me just say that the uh, this definition of energy cascade based on the um, on the divergence in scale space seems to be more fundamental because that's the one also where we uh, we do obey the uh, fluctuation relation. Again, small systems, small averaging times compared to the microscopic dynamics give rise to apparent violations, not of true thermodynamics, but of sort of thermodynamic uh, 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 framework that might be, might, we might build in the future around eddy systems where uh, second law violations can be observed. And again, I think it's uh, sort of helpful that uh, that we at least there's one prediction from non-equilibrium thermodynamics that seems to be followed by uh, turbulent systems. Uh, and uh, and with that, I uh, want to thank you. And uh, if there's any questions, please ask. So we'll start with the introduction of the Kolmogorov refined similarity hypothesis. So yeah. if anyone wants to ah, speak. it was me. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. No, no, the speakers. Uh, so yeah. with that, we will start with the two questions online first, okay. I guess. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. So please ask yep. any questions if you want. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. You can? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, look, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, and I guess I'll start by saying uh, welcome to this big entropy journey. So, <laughs> and I mean, this is something that, I mean, you know, I've been on for a, a long time. Um, and the reason why I do it is because I see it as the most fundamental thing to spend my time on. 
So, so, but it, that message hasn't really spread very widely in fluid mechanics. So, so thanks for that. Um, you now you started off your talk casting, taking the traditional approach, everything in terms of energies, and then, but at the end, you corrected yourself and you came back to entropies. And I guess I'll make that point is that dissipation is an entropic quantity. And so to do it correctly, you have to measure these things as terms of entropy variables. So entropy fluxes, entropy production, entropy-based quantities, and that's the correct way to do it. And then that means, and as you did show at the end, you've got to bring that temperature inside all of your integrals. The temperature itself can fluctuate. And so you've got to account for those fluctuations as well as the fluctuations in your other quantities. I'm not quite sure you've got that to that point, but if you go through the literature on the entropy production, like look at Adrian Bejan's works or look at uh, that textbook by de Groot and Mazur and so on, you'll find that that's what people do. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. I don't really have any comment to say what you're doing is correct or not correct, but I'm very intrigued by some of the results that you're getting. And so that's, that's nice. Um, so, and in terms of the fluctuation theorem now, now, um, you'll know there are many people in Australia who've worked on this. Um, and my connection to that is a little bit different. What I see that is come out of, that's a result that's come out of physics. And as far as I can tell, it's a result that applies to an equilibrium system. So a system that is moving towards an equilibrium position, uh, which is quite different to a flow system, which is sort of suspended. It's suspended in a steady state or it's suspended in a non-steady state flow. It's driven. It's a driven system. And so what the fluctuation people are doing is applying something about relaxation towards equilibrium and they're applying that to a flow system and in some ways they're crossing their fingers and hoping it all works um of course you know I, we can have a lot of debate i'm sure there may be there's people in this audience we can have a debate about this but but uh, a lot of it hangs on you know is your system in local equilibrium etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a lot of kind of baggage that comes with using the fluctuation theorem and that's why i'm very interested to see that you're getting some results out of it uh, i'm a little surprised um and it means i might have to change some of my thinking but that's something that i'll certainly encourage you to try and find some fundamental explanation yeah thanks uh, thanks robert mm. thanks for mm. sending me that email um yeah uh i i think the the i, I guess you, there are two parts to your question uh, the first one we have not tried to divide by the instantaneous local temperature without first doing this averaging over the sphere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know what that would do, uh, to be honest, if we divide by the sort of uh, non-spherically averaged uh, temperature, but, but in a way the, the spherically averaged version is already, is still local, right? So it's still, yeah. still local. Yeah. It's yeah. still very much local. Mm. So maybe that's okay. Um, the, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, it's still a big question mark as, as far as we're concerned. Um, uh, I, I, I did find it interesting that as long as we define this entropy generation rate by dividing by the right temperature, we, we did observe this linear growth and we did not, clearly we did not, uh, if we, we didn't divide by the temperature, but again, it's a, it's a local instantaneous temperature, but still defined by averaging over local you know, the sort of the kinetic energy of a small amount of, of small scale eddies, but a small amount, a small number. Because in, a, in any given sphere, there's only, I don't know, five or six small scale eddies, let's say. Yeah, no, that, I mean, you've got to define it somehow. I mean, that's, uh, it, it's the same as any any kind of discretization method. I mean, this is, this is really what you're doing. So the question is, if it works, why does it work? I mean, that's, that's the interesting question. So, but it's great. Yeah, I think we our interpretation of why it works possibly might be there might be a a described the descri a macroscopic description of the of the of the large scale eddies that somehow for whom this is the small scale stuff that's being used to define kinetic energy and so on and 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 once once you believe that 
to me, it's pretty obvious that face space of those large scale quantities would have these exponential growth and, 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 and you know, on average decrease, but, uh, but uh, exponential structure from the sort of from the chaotic behavior type, Lyapunov exponent type stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where, that's where in this fluctuation relation, that's where it really comes from, from Lyapunov exponent type analysis of volume in phase space. You have exponentials essentially, which. Uh, yeah, thanks Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, I just want to give audience a chance here if there's any questions from the audience here. Yes, Martin. I see some people using higher order structure functions. Is that something that sort of has an advantage or really just yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. Yeah, we have not really looked at that in this context. Uh I think we we will start looking at it in the sense that the um, I guess those those PDFs right that that's related with the shape of the PDFs and as you could see they're not Gaussian at all they're exponential which again is not quite what the many of these systems uh, uh, thermodynamic systems would would imagine you would have so uh, I would say right now there's pretty much zero connection right now with these high order structure functions yeah thanks. Uh, conscious of time, is there any other last questions from? Chat, yeah, so from I'm online. Do you know the uh, chat? Yeah. Oh, it's from. It's Robert. Robert yeah, yeah, it's he, just, uh, it's yeah, yeah, it's from. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, is there any anyone else online? There's any questions for Charles? No. Yeah. Uh, if not, yeah. Ho hope you. Enjoy your stay with us at the way and open to another invite to visit us again. Very much so. Thank you. All right, so, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Also. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.